All right, we're going to start at Exodus, the 20th chapter. And we're going first to the 8th verse. And instead of having readers, uh, I, just for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and just read the scriptures. But please follow along with me. This is Exodus, the 20th chapter, and the 8th verse. And the title of the Bible study, again, is Polluting God's Sabbaths. Um, and that will make specific sense uh, in a, a little while. So the eighth verse says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Does that sound familiar to any former Sunday school students? <laughs> Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Notice that it is very specifically a a Sabbath that belongs to God. It is a day that belongs to God. It's a, the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, uh, thou nor thy son. So your son doesn't get to work. Your daughter doesn't get to work. Your servants don't get to work. Right. And guess what? Your cattle don't even get to work. So your cattle get a day off. And not even the stranger that is within thy gates. So the 11th verse here says, For in six days... The Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is uh, in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That means he made it holy. It's like no other day of the week because God himself made it holy. And it's a day that belongs to him, that's separated Unto him, And then it goes on and says, Honor thy father and thy mother. Well, guess we're, what we're reading? A list of the Ten Commandments. So, the, keeping the Sabbath holy is the fourth commandment that you learned in the list of ten. Now, how many of us as kids, if that's when you learned this, thought, well, I don't know what this really means, but I'm just going to quote it so I can get my prize. <laughs> but we're going to find out exactly what God had in mind and why it still applies to us. The same chapter, 20th chapter, and the 20th verse is exactly what God brought us to with regard to last year and this year. Exodus 2020 says... And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. And of course, I preach the message that you can go back to if you're listening to this online uh, about um, the glory of God that is being revealed and what last year was about and what this year is about. Of course, 2020, the Lord brought me to Exodus 2020, and then he brought me to Exodus 2021. So we might as well read that while we're here. It says, And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And of course, we know that represents the glory of God. So what happened last year? We were in a time of testing. God was, was proving his church and qualifying his church and testing his church to see what they would do without warning with his Sabbaths. And so he allowed pestilence to come in. It's a test we've never been through before. And so he, according to what he said would be in the last days, that there would be pestilence, right? He allowed that to come in as a sign of the end times but he was also testing what his church would do with regard to his Sabbaths, which are holy to him. He made them holy, not some individual, not some person, but God himself made the Sabbaths holy. All right. And, and so, of course, uh, the church failed the test. We know uh, everything that happened with all the shutdowns, with all the fear, with uh, everybody saying, well, we, we need to listen to the authorities, not to the pastors. Uh, and the pastor saying, well, I have to listen to the authorities and I'm just going to shut my church. God never gave one church permission to shut down. Right. 
God never gave one ministry permission to shut down. And if you think that this is something that is just a one-time shot, mark my words, this is precisely how the Antichrist will be able to take over the church during the tribulation. It's exactly how the Antichrist will step in as the law and begin dictating various right. things. And guess what? Every Christian on social media is going to be arrogant and oh. self-righteous and say, well, you have to obey the laws of the land. Who do you think you are, pastor? Look, there are some people that are getting ready for some big kicks in the backside from God because of the things that they did last year with regard to disrespecting the men of God who, were, who had given their lives to the ministry. And yet these little snot-nosed idiots had the audacity to get on social media and presume to say that they don't know what they're doing. They have to listen to who I say they have to listen to. Who do you think you are? How much of your life have you given to the ministry and to hearing from God and to pastoring? Don't you ever put yourself in a place to touch God's anointed. I'm telling you, it's not going to be a person that causes retribution, but you're positioning yourself for retribution from God. Um, So that happened last year. That happened to me last year on social media. Um, And so it is a very dangerous thing, and it's something that God is going to be taking care of this year. Uh, I don't wish ill on anybody, but guess what? Vengeance is not mine. But vengeance is God's, and vengeance does exist, and vengeance will be carried out by God. Uh, We better not get ourselves into a position of wanting to do that for God, uh, because God will take care of it. And so we have to forgive, we have to move on. But the reason I uh, am so blunt with this is because, look, I want to just be very clear In my life, people have not survived things like this. And I won't get into details, but very recently, somebody didn't survive something like this. So I will tell you, God will cut lives short because of this. That's why I'm not messing around when I talk about it, because I have seen it up close and personal. And it's not a joke to stand against God's anointed. You better, look, if you disagree, shut your mouth. Keep your mouth shut. If you want to not have to have the wrath of God really mess your life up at the very least. So the Sabbaths, why, why am I so serious on a subject like this? Well, when you read... In, we're not going to go to this scripture, but when you read in Exodus, there was a penalty for not keeping the Sabbath. Do you know what that penalty was? The death penalty. If someone perverted or polluted the Sabbath, you know what they did? They took them out and executed them. And that was the will of God to take out the corruption from his people. Now, this is just a fact. Uh, You cannot like that all you want, but that's how important God's Sabbath was to him. Now, that was under the law, and we don't have the death penalty in the New Testament for anything in the church. Um, You know, God might still have the death penalty on the the table, but we don't carry that out. (laughs) Um, Thank God we're under grace. Amen. Amen. But I want to bring you, so, you know, many people just love, you know, especially the grace preachers, the greasy grace people is what I call them in my book. Um, They love to just say, well, we're not under the law, therefore we can do whatever we want, and God just looks the other way. Well, there's a reason that the Ten Commandments are still taught in the church today, and that is because... Jesus himself, when speaking of the commandments, when he used that phrase, he was very specifically referring to the Ten Commandments. And you might want to jot this down. Um, 
he said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? Well, when he's speaking of commandments, according to Mark 10, 19, and also Luke 18, 20, he details that he is spe- specifically talking about the Ten Commandments. He starts quoting them. He goes through about five of them. He says, you know the, the commandments. They are honor your father and mother. And he goes on and on with these listing these Ten Commandments. So there's no question that when Jesus said commandments, he was talking about the Ten Commandments. So why would he be so adamant about the Ten Commandments if he just thought, well, you can pick and choose this one and the Sabbath, well, don't worry about that one anymore, right? So the Ten Commandments are intact, but we have to understand what they mean for us uh, with regard to the New Testament, which is now the new, um, after Calvary, the the dispensation of grace, uh, which we're under today in the church and how all of that works. So, Uh, Let's go to one more passage here in Exodus. Let's go to the 31st chapter. I want to just show you something real quick with regard to the Sabbath. And the 16th verse, it says, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Perpetual means what? forever it doesn't stop it's never abolished according to god so it is a perpetual covenant look at verse 17 it's a sign between me and the children of israel forever for in six days the lord made heaven and earth and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed So we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But I want to point you to the fact that this is forever, that there was never going to come a time when the Sabbath was no longer holy to God, where the Sabbath no longer had to be uh, recognized and remembered, right? The commandment is remember the Sabbath and keep it holy uh, because it's holy unto God. So so this is forever. Well, that's just uh, for Israel. And we're not Israel, right? Well, let's look at Galatians, the third chapter. And the 26th verse, Galatians 3 and 26 says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. And then, of course, this ought to be real familiar. The 28th verse says there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ. Look at verse 29. And if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So you are literally by your faith in Jesus Christ, your baptism into the body of Christ, you are an heir of the promise of Abraham. And of course, in Hebrews... And in Romans, it teaches very clearly that we are grafted in to the promises of Israel and uh, that we are the seed of Abraham. We are the children of Abraham. So, do you think that something that is perpetually commanded to be carried out throughout all the generations of the seed of Abraham would apply to somebody who has faith in Jesus? Mm -hmm. You bet you it is. Uh, It is uh, perpetual. Perpetual, That means it applies to us. I almost said you bet your booty, but I decided (laughs) not to. (laughs) Uh, So let's take a look at Matthew, the fifth chapter. Matthew, the fifth chapter and the 19th verse. Look at this. This is going to drive it home even a little bit further. It says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, Jesus is speaking here, so he's talking about the Ten Commandments uh, in the law, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in Basilea, kingdom of God. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in Basilea in the kingdom of heaven. 
Mm -hmm. All right. So now we have a direct tie between the commandments, the keeping of them and the teaching of them, and your level in Basilea. So that ought to be personal. Let's get even a little more personal. Let's go to Isaiah, the 56th chapter, and we're going to start at the fourth verse. Isaiah 56 and 4. Most of us really like parts of this, but I wonder if we like the first part. Uh, verse 4 says, For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs, but not just any eunuchs, it's the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths. Wow. There it is. Yep. Just to finish the, the verse here, it's the ones that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Verse 5 says, Even unto them will I give in mine house. And within my walls, a place and a name better than of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name, an everlasting name, and it shall not be cut off. So let me just point out to you that this is a prophecy that was never fulfilled until the last generation of the last century. So this was fulfilled in the last generation of the 20th century, beginning in about 1968 through the end of the century. And we find that within the church, the eunuch nation begins to take their place. Let's, uh, let's go forward to uh, verse 6. It says, Also the sons of the stranger, this is talking about Gentiles, that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. So he's getting even more specific there. And then he's saying of all these that I've just been talking about, verse 7, get this, even them will I bring to my holy mountain, now, according to the book of Joel, that holy mountain is none other than Zion, yep. which is a type and shadow of the church. So what is this prophecy saying? These individuals will be, the prophecy is they will be brought into the church. They're going to be brought to my holy mountain, and I'll make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar to mine uh, for mine house shall be called the house of prayer for all people. Jesus stood in the temple and uh, after the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he stood in the temple and he quoted this very scripture in Isaiah, legitimizing everything about it. Jesus, God manifest in the flesh, stood in his temple and he said, I have said in my word that this is my house and I sh will call my house the house of prayer for all people. So he was quoting this scripture about the eunuch nation. Can you imagine that? Wow. And so, so this, is, this is a spectacularly important scripture for those of us in this room and those that are part of the eunuch nation and very specifically those of us who have felt like uh, second-rate stepchildren in the kingdom of God. You need to understand that 700 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, before God took on flesh and walked on this earth, 700 years prior, there was a, a, a spectacular prophecy by none other than the same prophet that prophesied that unto us a child is born. And that prophecy said they're going to be gay people in the house of God and they will receive a position and a place within my house. Hallelujah. They're going to be transgender people in my house and their sacrifices of praise will be received in my house. Now, I don't know if that goes through you the way that it does me, but that is phenomenal. We had better not 
act like we're second class. We had better not act like this phenomenal truth that God has revealed to us is anything but what it is. A, 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 a very uh, important and defining truth of the church age. So why, why is that important? Because we just read that this is for the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, right? Mm. So you're not qualified for this promise unless you're part of the eunuch nation that keeps my Sabbaths and chooses the things that please me and well. takes hold of my covenant. Mm-hmm. Now, I will say this, that long before this revelation really took root in the very small portion of the church that has received it, Jezebel was busy with social justice churches taking gay people out of contention before they could ever receive revelation from the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And social justice churches taught gay people, yes, you can be in the church, but we no longer believe the Bible. Yeah, come on. So you don't have to get to reconciliation through the Bible. That's too hard. Just believe what we're saying. We're going to repurpose the church to believe in uh, social justice, in self-righteousness, not in the righteousness of God. And, uh, you know, interestingly, it was Isaiah that said self-righteousness is as filthy rags. So this is a really important revelation for somebody. Look, I don't need to sit and teach a three-day seminar to you about reconciliation if you can get a hold of the simple prophecy that was laid out by the prophet Isaiah. And then all you have to do is go to the fact that Jesus stood in the temple and quoted that prophecy to all of the priests and all of the the governing leadership of the the Jewish nation in that moment. God manifest in the flesh validated the eunuch nation as part of his house, part of his plan, part of his ministry. Hallelujah. 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 You're not a second class citizen. You're part of the plan of God. And then you can go to Matthew, the 19th chapter, where Jesus said, not everybody is able to receive this. But there are some eunuchs that were born that way. And there are some eunuchs that were made that way. And there are some eunuchs that made themselves that way for the purpose of the kingdom of God. Now, I don't have time to go into all of the details of that, but I just want to establish for you that this, this teaching and this testing that we've just been through has direct connection to who we are, our very specific identity. And I, I think everybody in this room, and I hope everyone that is listening to me online understands that I'm not just talking in the flesh about gay and transgender people. Uh, I hope you understand that there is a spiritual aspect, and all you have to do is go to Matthew 19 and see what Jesus was saying, that the eunuch nation is not just made up of eunuchs who were born that way, but it's also made up of individuals who have received the prophetic revelation and understand our specific part to play in end time Uh, prophecy being revealed. And I don't have time to go into this either, but the two uh, purposes of the eunuch nation in the last days are very clearly defined when you read Esther, because who was it that was preparing the bride getting ready to marry the king? It was none other than a man named Higay. Do with that what you want, but that was his name. He was the chief eunuch And what did he do to help the bride prepare herself? He gave her the implements for her purification. And guess what one of those implements was? It was oil. And then Jesus comes along and he says, I have a parable for you about some foolish and some wise virgins. And what is the difference? The extra oil of revelation was absent in the foolish virgins. The ones that became the bride had the extra oil of anointing for revelation. There's a lot there. 
uh, and I've taught on all of this before, but I want to bring to you the, the uh, nature of why this is so crucial to this Bible study. All right. We are the eunuch nation that has been called to prepare the bride specifically with revelation about who the bride is and what is necessary to qualify the bride to rule and reign with the bridegroom. Right. And uh, and so there's that aspect. The other purpose uh, is found in Second Kings and the story of Ahab and Jezebel. And when a future king named Jehu was anointed to be king, God had an assignment for him prior to his being crowned as king and coronated as king. And that assignment was to go to Jezebel's house and to call upon three, uh, two or three eunuchs in Jezebel's house to throw her down and to defeat this wicked queen who was Jezebel. And so we uh, have heard a lot of preaching on that too. So so if God is only using the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, then I think we better pay close attention to that as part of our identity. It's not just any eunuch. There's a whole lot of eunuchs. I would say that all the eunuchs that should have been sitting where you're sitting, the vast majority were taken out early by the spirit of Jezebel. Jezebel just took her arm and said, look, all of you don't pay attention to the scripture anymore, but social justice over this way, no effort required on your part, just be who you are. Right? And so many of those who should be sitting where you're sitting they didn't want to pay the price Uh for truth. And the word says truth doesn't come cheap. As a matter of fact, you've got to buy the truth and sell it not. So you're sitting where you are because you've been willing to pay a price. Am I right about that? Some of you have lost friends. Probably all of you have lost friends. Some of you are not close to family members any longer because you stepped in to some things that God was showing you and, and it drove a wedge between you and your family. Now that should not sound like it's some strange concept. Jesus said, I came to separate you from your family members. Yep. Yeah, come on. Yeah. I came to cause division f- between brother and brother, mother and daughter, father and son, and so on. You look it up. Jesus literally said, I came to bring division. I didn't come to bring happiness and peace between everybody. He said, you think I came to bring peace? I came to bring a sword. Yeah. The sword of the word of God. And it will divide you from people that you love sometimes when you make a decision. Is, is, is this making sense to anybody? Yeah. Have you lived through that? But how many know that whatever price you pay for the truth is just like, it, it's just like the, the parable of the man who found the pearl of great price and he went and he sold everything he had so that he could buy the field. It doesn't matter what I have to pay. I've got to have that treasure that is buried in that field. And that's what Jesus equated with the truth of the word of God. How do I know? Because later he said, don't cast your pearls before swine. Speaking of truth and revelation. Hallelujah. I, I, I'm telling you, truth is worth everything. Yes. It is worth everything. Hallelujah. Okay, so it's the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath, that take hold of my covenants, and that are faithful to the things that please me, that choose the things that please me, not the choose the, the things that please themselves. I will tell you this, every eunuch that chose politics did not choose the things that please God. I don't care right, left, center. If you chose politics, you missed God. Because politics are beneath the precepts of the Word of God and the truths of the Word of God. All right, let's go to Isaiah, the 28th chapter, because I want to show you something quickly here. Um, We're going to look at Isaiah, the 28th chapter, uh, and the 10th verse. (laughs) 
So Isaiah, the 28th chapter and the 10th verse, you've heard me uh, quote this recently in my messages. It says, for precept must be upon precept, precept yes. upon precept, yep. line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So with regard to truth and revelation, if you try to skip ahead, it's not going to work because you need to build upon truth, right. truth upon truth, foundational stones and foundational bricks upon one another. And if you leave, leave a big space because that wasn't a convenient truth for you to receive, what's going to happen to your foundation with a bunch of holes in it? It's going to crumble. And I don't have a lot of time to get into this, but I preached a message on Sunday about false prophets. Yeah. And I will tell you that all of these false prophets, I didn't have a lot of time to talk about this on Sunday, but all of these false prophets, the reason that they're moving into false doctrine is because there is a major component of the foundation of the truth of revelation and revelatory uh, things that God had in store for them that they just said, no, I'm not having that one. But I want to move ahead into these other revelations. And so what came out was this contorted, uh, messed up version of false prophecy and false revelation to where now they're looking to future things and they were not willing to receive this fundamental foundational principle that God was showing the church in the last revelation of uh, the last, sorry, generation of the 20th century. They said, nope, we're passing that one by and we just want to move ahead and we want to prophesy all these things about the kingdom age and about what's coming next and the future things and end time prophecy. And the reason it's all contorted and a big mess is because they refuse to humble themselves to receive one of the foundational fundamental principles that God would reveal in the church age. And it was the foundational truth of reconciliation. Amen. And they passed that by and said, no, we don't like that one. Why? Because Jezebel hates us. And Jezebel got in there and she said, Oh no, I remember what those eunuchs did to me. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in and preempt even the eunuch nation from getting a hold of the very truth that would bring them liberty and bring them freedom to worship God and to be used in my house and to be used in great places, to have a name that's greater than sons and daughters. I'm going to preempt that, cut it off at the knees by uh, causing them to think it's all about lust. And it's all about the things of the flesh and all that lust and all that flesh. Welcome to this place over here called social justice. It's all natural. It's all perfectly fine. And anything that Paul said, don't pay attention to that. Don't pay attention to the Old Testament. Don't pay attention to Scripture. I, I could go through an hour of talking about my experiences with these social justice people as they left Pentecost. And what that looked like. I literally had uh, a leader of a major um, fellowship in that area tell me, well, we don't really have to pay attention to the Word of God. And the Bible is not the truth. There might be a little bit of truth in the Bible, but the Bible is not the truth. And hey, maybe we're looking for another New Testament. Bye to be uncovered so we can truly understand the thing. So, you know, what Jezebel does is she moves aside because the word of God will get the job done. So you have to literally either pervert it or step away from it. The left stepped away from it and went into social justice. That's why the whole left politically is all about social justice. By the way, social justice is the end time church of Laodicea. Laodicea literally means social justice in the Greek. Now, Sunday I preached about Jezebel's uh, function and what she's been doing. She's been busy on the right side of politics and, and the false prophets and and all of the charismatic movement that has aligned itself politically with those on the right. Look, if you ever doubted 
what I've been saying to you for the last few years, that we will never preach politics in this church. We will never defile the word of God and the truths of the word of God with human politics. Then you ought to be convinced by now Amen. with what we've just been through right. and what we've seen right. and what God has shown us. The most spectacular display of what he said to watch for that I've ever seen. He said that you better watch for false prophets because they're going to rise up in the end times. And that's one of the signs that I'm getting ready to come back. Amen. And, um, and, and so, uh, but I want you to see this, that um, I didn't mean to get so far into that, but look at the 11th verse here. <laughs> the 11th verse says this, for with stammering lips and another tongue, will he speak to his people? Now, if you have the Holy Ghost, then you know exactly what that's talking about. That's right. yeah. You, you know exactly. Nobody has to sit down and talk you through it or convince you. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you're probably thinking, what does this mean? Oh, let's do a Bible study on it. Let's worry about what, you know, is this, is this you know, uh, you know, you just go into all different uh, arguments of what it is. No, if you've ever been filled with the Holy Ghost, you know exactly what Isaiah was saying. Even though Isaiah hadn't been through this and experienced it, you know what he was prophesying. Yeah. Right? Just like you know, beyond the shadow of a doubt, if you're part of the eunuch nation, that, that Isaiah was prophesying about you. Yeah. Right? Amen. Amen. You know. Let me tell you this. Prophecy will resonate within your spirit when it is yeah, legitimate right. and true and directed to you. It will, whether it's Bible prophecy that's recorded in Scripture or whether it's somebody operating in the gift of prophecy. And, uh, and so um, this is talking about receiving the Holy Ghost. Verse 12, this is really important to this Bible study because it says that to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. So this is Isaiah, um, 733 and a half years before the day of Pentecost, <laughs> roughly. Um, and he's prophesying that receiving the Holy Ghost and speaking in other tongues is the fulfillment of rest. Well, what does the Sabbath mean? We already read that we have to keep it holy because on the seventh day, God rested, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the rest that uh, is available to the people of God, well, Isaiah prophesies there's coming a time when you're going to find out the fulfillment is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right. And um, I want to go quickly to Colossians, the second chapter in the 16th verse. I'm oh, sorry, Colossians 2, 16. And it says this, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Now, does this contradict the fact that God said you have to remember the Sabbath to keep it holy you have to keep the Sabbath because it's holy to me. It's my Sabbath. Does this contradict what we're saying that the Ten Commandments are forever and they're a statute? Um, are, are we contradicting that those who are going to have a name better than sons and daughters in the eunuch nation are the ones that keep the Sabbaths? And, and by the way, uh, the point that I was trying to make with all of that is that Isaiah's prophecy of the eunuchs it, that was never going to be fulfilled until the last generation of the 20th century. Right. So keeping the Sabbaths is part of that. That means that we have to figure out what that means, what, that, mm. what that's referring to. So that is something that's been fulfilled just recently. So, um, so let's, let's read on. Verse 17 says, here's why. Because the holy days and the new moons and the Sabbath days are a shadow mm -hmm. of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Mm -hmm. So now we take that and look back at where Isaiah prophesied that there's coming a time where the fulfillment of rest will be seen 
with stammering lips in an unknown tongue. So the baptism of the Holy Ghost is the spiritual fulfillment of the Sabbath of the Lord. So how does that all come together? Well, first let me take you, we're in, uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, and the 18th verse. Now, clearly here, Paul is talking about speaking in tongues. How do I know? He says, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. Right? So is he discussing speaking in tongues? Yeah. No two ways about it. He said, I speak in tongues more than you do. But then when you go down to the 21st verse... He says, in the law, it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Now, he is literally quoting Isaiah 28 with reference to speaking in tongues. So don't ever let anybody tell you that that prophecy is not talking about speaking in tongues after having been filled with the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Paul proved it right there for us. Just like Jesus proved what was meant in Isaiah 56 by quoting that standing in the temple. All right? So um, so let's talk about this rest. How do, how do we keep the Sabbath? Do we just get the Holy Ghost and then that's all there is to it? And, no. and then we've no. kept the Sabbath? No, it's something perpetual. That means it's ongoing. And not only does perpetual mean forever, but it means ongoing. It means something that we have to continue to do in order to fulfill this commandment. And uh, we talked about this being a commandment, right? It's one of the Ten Commandments. And then Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Let's look at Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Everybody with me? Yes, amen. So Hebrews, the fourth chapter, in the third verse, it says... For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works." So everybody with me, this is talking about the seventh day where, you know, God was creating earth uh, and all the fullness of the earth and everything in it. In six days on the seventh day, he rested. We went through that in the Ten Commandments. That was why he made the Sabbath holy. It was about uh, rest. Well, how many know that God doesn't need rest in a literal sense? Right? God doesn't sleep. The Bible says that he never sleeps or slumbers. Right? So he doesn't literally need rest. Um, However, he knew that we needed rest on both a physical level and a spiritual level. But if keeping the Sabbath is literally now in the New Testament about rest... And if Sunday is the Christian Sabbath, which is what I'm going to make an argument for in just a, a bit, how many feel rested on Sunday? No. <laughs> if you're in ministry of any kind, or even if you're really a serious worshiper, we work you to death on Sunday. I'm telling you, I am not exhausted anywhere near like I am on Sunday any of the rest of the week. So it is not literally for me or for anybody in this room, I would say, uh, a literal day of rest. However, we know that with, with regard to how God defines the Sabbath, his Sabbath, by the way, I want you to notice that in, in many places in the scriptures that we're reading and will read, he says, these are my Sabbaths. Yeah. He, says, he says, this is personal to me. I have set this up as a covenant between you and me. Therefore, if you're polluting the Sabbath, you're polluting my Sabbath. Wow. Wow. This is personal. And, and what I'm trying to teach you today is that polluting the Sabbath is a personal offense to God. 
So that's why this Bible study is not called keeping the Sabbath. This Bible study is called polluting the Sabbath. Okay. Um, so Hebrews, the fourth chapter, uh, we've read the third verse and the fourth. Um, let's start up at five. It says, and in this place again, if they shall enter into, into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. So what Paul is saying is, and by the way, Hebrews is to the Hebrews, which are the Jews. And so what he is teaching to the Jews is that rest that you're so familiar with that is, that is um, kept by keeping the Sabbath. Well, that rest is fulfilled in a different way, and most of you haven't entered into it yet. And so he's saying that uh, those who have not entered in have not entered into it by unbelief. That exists in the church as well. Most of the church does not believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And so it still remaineth to the people of God to enter into that rest. Um, look at verse 7. Again, he limiteth a certain day. This is so important to get. He limiteth or he designates a certain day, saying in David, David prophesied today after so long a time, as it is said today, if you will hear my voice, hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Um, and look at this, verse 8 says, for if Jesus had given this rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Does anybody know what day is being spoken of here as the the significant day that would fulfill coming into the rest for the people of God. It's the day of Pentecost. Of course it is. Because the day that the Holy Ghost would be poured out didn't happen until Jesus ascended up. And as he was getting ready to ascend, he said, you'll receive power after the Holy Ghost is poured out upon you. Amen. And so that's why it says even Jesus, while he was on earth, did not fulfill this entering into rest. But he said, it's a day after I ascend into heaven. So can anybody doubt that it is the day of Pentecost that fulfilled this rest that is spoken of with stammering lips in another tongue will I speak to my people, Isaiah 28, and this is the rest wherewith I will cause my people to rest. Look at verse 10. It says, um, for he then is entered into his rest. He also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Uh, and it says, uh, well, let me stop there because we're not going to go into this, but in Galatians, uh, you can read about in the fifth chapter, the works of the flesh. And it very specifically says the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And it goes into all the works of the flesh. And then it specifically says, if you do these things, you're not part of the kingdom of God. Right. You will not be part of Basilea. Now we've taught that and taught that, but uh, here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, he's saying by entering into the rest, by being baptized in the Holy Ghost, there is power that is given to you to cease the works of the flesh. Mm. And I would make an argument that you are not capable of ceasing from the works of the flesh without the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Mm. You might be uh, t uh, just fooling yourself and deluding yourself into thinking that you're living above all of these things. But the fact of the matter is, if you're not baptized in the Holy Ghost, you don't have the power to cease from your own works, the works of the flesh. So uh, let, let's go to just one more verse in this passage. Um, verse 11 says, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. What example of unbelief? Well, earlier in this passage, it's the Jews 
that didn't enter. This is to the Hebrews, remember? It's the Jews that because of unbelief and didn't believe that Jesus was who he said, didn't believe him when he said, I'm going to send a comforter, didn't believe him when he said, I'll give you power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you because of their unbelief. They never entered into the fulfillment of the rest that was prophesied by their own prophet Isaiah. And that's what Paul is saying here. And he said, now you need to labor to enter into that rest. Now, what does that mean? That word labor, it, it, uh, it literally means hasten. So hurry up and get the Holy Ghost is what Paul is saying. You need to hasten and enter into receiving the Holy Ghost. We should never apologize in this church for preaching the baptism of the Holy Amen. Ghost and making continual uh, opportunities available for people to come and, and receive the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm past the point of praying with somebody for 14 hours, but I'll just tell you this. I would love nothing more than for somebody to come at the conclusion of every single service and say, Pastor, I need the Holy Ghost. I didn't get it last Sunday. I'm here again. And you know what? There's nothing that would thrill me more than somebody that hungry to be filled with the Holy Ghost. We've come into a place in the church where we feel like we have to beg people to receive the promise of the Holy Ghost, and it ought not to be that way. Amen. I'm praying for a moment of the glory of God to be revealed so that people come in the doors so hungry for God that they'll do whatever it takes and they'll, they'll be in a place where they're desperate for what God has for them. You know, there were 120 on the day of Pentecost that said, we're here as long as it takes. We're here as long as it takes. We want to see the promise that Jesus made to us. I believe it's coming. I believe it's coming. I believe there's coming a time when we won't be able to preach because people just can't even, they, they can't pull it together because they begin to have stammering lips right in their seats in the church. And all we have to do is go back and just just. Give them a few words of, of encouragement and a few words of guidance and just tell them what they need to do. You know, that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. All right. They said, what do we need to do? After he stood up and he began to preach, they said, what do we need to do? We want the Holy Ghost. We want what God has promised. We see these were all Jews that, that were there from every Jewish nation on earth. Every part of the known world was there represented on the day of Pentecost. And all they, they could say after Peter stood up and said, this is that spoken by the prophet Joel. They were convicted in their hearts and they said, what do we have to do to to receive what you've just preached to us. Mm. Listen to me, there's coming a time when we're not going to have to argue and make almost a, a, uh, a case like an attorney sometimes to prove our point. I believe hungry people are coming in. I believe the glory of God is going to move and it's going to change the dynamics and the atmosphere of ministry in this church. The word of God said, Jesus taught that when you've been faithful over a few things, I'm going to make you ruler over many things. I'm going to bless your ministry. I'm going to bless the things that you've been faithful over and they're going to prosper in the things that I have determined that they would prosper in. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. I know the plans that I've written in my book and they're not going to stay small, but I'm going to bless those who have been faithful over a few things. Amen. There are those of us in this church that we have labored year after year after year over small things, uh, over things that seem like they would never ever get off the ground, over elements of the ministries that have been started in this church. And, and the vision was this big, but we see only this much success. But I want to tell you tonight in the Holy Ghost uh, that that is not the way that it's going to be moving forward. Uh, the glory of God is about to be revealed. The blessings of God are about to come forth to bring about fulfillment of the word of God. He said that those that have been faithful, those that have stood 
strong and those that have continued to be faithful to pray and to preach and to teach and to do the things that I've called you to do. It's not going to be for nothing. But when my glory is revealed in my church, it's going to be greater than anybody has seen. And the glory of the latter house, it's going to be more glorious and greater than anything that was ever seen in the Bible days. If you receive that, lift your hands right now. Show your glory, God. Show your glory, God. He had an Hassandera Hassalana Bassat. Ah, yes, Sadana Bocola, Ramasata, yes, Satan. Hallelujah. Who? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 All right. Let's try to get through the rest of this. <laughs> Whew, I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I feel I feel just just the beginning of that glory that is getting ready to present itself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So so we understand that there's a prophetic fulfillment that we see and that Paul teaches with regard to the rest and the fulfillment of the Sabbath. By the word, uh, or by the way, <laughs> by the way, does anybody know what the word Sabbath means? Rest. To rest. It literally means, it's Shabbat in the Hebrew, and it simply means to rest. So it's not this big mysterious word, but um, so, so rest, what does that mean when we come to church on Sunday and we're wore out after we've been in church? Well, rest is a spiritual concept to receive rest. Hebrews, also written to the same group of people uh, in the same book, the 10th chapter and the 25th verse, here's what Paul says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, And so much the more as ye see the day approaching. So, just because the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a spiritual fulfillment of the Sabbath with regard to this is how we receive spiritual rest. Uh, By the way, anyone who has not received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of of speaking in other tongues has never experienced the rest of God. Right. Okay. Get your brain around that. We have this weird idea sometimes that our brothers and sisters in the church are more legitimate because of numbers yeah. 
that don't believe what the Bible teaches about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. No, they're the ones who are in error. All right. And there's no mistaking that the baptism of the Holy Ghost was always going to be key in the plans that God had for his people. Amen. Amen. So we should never take second place just because somebody might have some doctorate of divinity somewhere or something like, you know what? So what? The Bible said that in the last days, there would be people who are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And the spirit of God, the Holy Ghost of God is none other, according to Jesus, than the spirit of truth. And you know, I believe in education, but, but Understand that all your education is nothing if you're not baptized in the Holy Ghost. Amen. You ha- you literally are lacking the spirit of truth. So, um, but uh, we just read this passage that says we're not off the hook. We still have to assemble faithfully. Yeah, um, and I will say this, that in the book of Acts and also in the epistles, we see that the New Testament church did not meet on the Sabbath any longer. Why did they not meet on the Sabbath? Well, number one, Jesus rose on the third day. He was crucified on Friday and he rose on Sunday. Therefore, Christianity always chose Sunday, which is the first day of the week. That's how we know what day it is and what it's speaking about. They always had church on Sunday. That's why we have church on Sunday. Because in the New Testament church, they got together and they met on Sunday. Another logical reason is this. They were preaching to Jews. And Jews could not go anywhere on the Sabbath. So they had to have church on Sunday in order to reach the Jews because the Jews were still celebrating the Sabbath uh, as the law dictated by not doing any kind of work, right? Make sense? Now, I read a scripture that uh, in Colossians where Paul taught that we don't let anybody judge us in the legality of even keeping the Sabbath. What does that mean? It's, he's talking to Jews, and he's specifically talking uh, about that, sing, that one part right there, because that same Paul in the same book wrote this scripture that says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together uh, all the more as you see the day approaching. So do you think that Paul was saying to them um, in Colossians that he said it's a shadow of things to come, right? That means that it's going to be fulfilled by something else. In, um, and then in Hebrews, uh, when he begins to talk about it, um, do you think he's letting everybody off the hook by saying, oh, don't let anybody judge you. You don't have to go to church. No, no that's completely inconsistent. You can't, you can't do that. You've got to take the whole word, rightly dividing the word of truth, right? And the same Paul is the one who wrote in Hebrews, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. So let me say this very clearly, keeping the Sabbath for us is coming to a Holy Ghost filled church every week on Sunday and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Amen. That is fulfilling the Sabbath. We fulfill the Sabbath by both receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, entering into the rest, that is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah, stammering lips and an unknown tongue, but also by coming to a place where we can be ministered to. And that's where the spiritual rest comes in because there is no other experience that you can ever have that will allow you to receive what you receive in the house of the Lord. Now I've been teaching a lot on the temple and about what Jesus said about his temple 
and about the house of the Lord and about uh, the prayers that are offered in the house of prayer and the sacrifices that are given in the house of sacrifice. I've been teaching a lot about that. There is no substitute... And look, I get it that sometimes people feel like they don't have a church to go to and there's all this online presence. But let me say this, that the reason that God is so offended with the church world that has tried to substitute an online ministry in place of the people of God coming physically and bodily into his house to offer the sacrifice of praise and to offer up the, uh, the specific prayers that are honored within the house of prayer is because they are polluting the Sabbaths of God. And they are personally offending God. These are his Sabbaths. He said, remember my Sabbath keep it holy. It's like no other day of the week. And let me say this, we're not legalistic and we're not trying to drag everybody back under the law, but you need to be careful about mixing and matching what you do on Sundays. You need to be careful about how much shopping and movie going and partying and whatever else you do on Sunday. Because if it's a day that is holy to God, now for most of us, we're too tired to well, think straight I after church is over. <laughs> but, you, but some people do a whole lot of stuff yeah. that is, is not honoring to keeping the Sabbath holy. Right. Now, understand, we're not a legalistic church. I've never given you a list no. of how to be holy. And I'm not going to give you a list of how to keep the Sabbath holy. But that is the commandment. So you have the Holy Ghost. You ought to rely on the conviction of the Holy Ghost for that. But that whole day needs to be set aside for the things of God. There are many times, Sister Kathy, as a matter of fact, years ago in Scottsdale, when she first started coming around and and first started experiencing the ministry of our church, uh, I remember one of the first services where we just had a blowout move of God. She came up to me after church and she said, Wow, Pastor, I, I, I had plans to go to dinner with somebody and I just need to go home. <laughs> I just have to go home. I, just ha- I don't know what to do with this. I just need to process this. And, and it, it really made me think, Wow, as Pentecostals, have we learned just to step past what God just did? And not allow it to fully Mm -hmm. assimilate into us and receive it completely just because, you know, we had plans after all. Mm. Right? Now, I'm not, understand, I'm not, I'm not being legalistic. This is up to you. I'm not going to dictate. But I am telling you that the commandment is to keep his Sabbath holy. And he is deeply offended with most of the church world who has polluted his Sabbaths. Um, So... I want to say this quickly, that um, in 2 Peter, I won't bother to go there for sake of time, but 2 Peter, the third chapter and the eighth verse, very clearly Peter says this, that one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day with the Lord. And um, so this takes us to something called dispensationalism. And uh, I will be talking more about dispensationalism on Sunday in my message. But it is the belief and a revelation that was received in the last generation of the 19th century. Um, And you're going to just be fascinated with how all that happened uh, in the timeline of God. But but dispensationalism was uh, the revelation that God has dealt with man's time on earth in seven distinct periods or dispensations. And, uh, and the reason I'm bringing this to you now is because a thousand years uh, is with the Lord as a day, and the, the week of creation, including the day of rest, you can specify that those are in thousands of years. And so that takes us to the 
the day of rest being a thousand year period of rest. And of course, when you begin to study about the millennial reign of Christ, which is a thousand years, it correlates with rest being upon the earth. And why does that matter to us? Because we are being groomed this very moment, the eunuchs who are preaching Basilea to the bride of Christ. We are being, those of us that keep the Sabbaths are being groomed to facilitate this entire period of the kingdom age. So that correlates again with the Sabbath because the Sabbath being a day of rest correlates with the thousand years of rest when Satan is thrown into the bottomless pit. He will no longer have power to to destroy. He will no longer have power to, uh, to bring temptation and the lion will lay down with the lamb. And we'll have peace upon the earth for a thousand years. So that's very relevant to a discussion of keeping the Sabbath. This is why God was so adamant about it, because he wanted to prove through this covenant, he defined it as keep this. It's my Sabbath because it's my way of showing you who I am. It's my way of showing you who I am. And, of course, we read that in the book of Ezekiel. We're going to go to that, that scripture in just a second. But, but he said, the reason I'm so offended is because I told you to keep my Sabbaths because my Sabbath reveals to you on an ongoing basis who I am. And let me say this. If you pull yourself away from a Sunday service, and I get vacation, I get sickness, but you better be in ICU. Because if you pull yourself away from keeping the Sabbath of God, you have missed an opportunity to be changed from glory to glory. God specifically ordained that time in the Holy Ghost to show you more of who He is. To reveal to you more of who He is. And you just decided to go on your merry way. I don't need to subject myself to that. I'm going to go do something else. I have literally had people come unashamed and say, well, we just decided to take a drive instead. Yeah. Oh, brother. I, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I had no words for them. I, I didn't even know what to say. Really, that's what you decided. We just decided we were going to go to Disneyland. We just decided, and look, I get vacations, but if you need a vacation every couple weeks, there's something wrong. You're not keeping the Sabbath if you're not faithful to the house of God. And you all know what my definition of faithfulness is. All right. So this is something that you need to be taking upon yourself to keep if you want to please God and not offend God. Look, I don't often dangle your feet over hellfire. (laughs) But there is a negative side of if you don't keep the commandments. And uh, and we're about to experience that this year, by the way, Uh, not personally, I hope. Uh, maybe some have disregarded uh, in last year the Sabbaths. Maybe some in our church did, and, and they better repent if they don't want to enjoy what's coming next. But um, I think most of us were faithful through a, a very terrible test. Most of us at some point felt like we were putting our lives on the line. And yet, we came to church. And yet... We said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And guess what? God came through. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. So, um, you can, uh, if you go to Revelation 20, uh, you can uh, read all about the millennial reign of Christ and the thousand years and Satan being uh, thrown into the pit. But I want to go, uh, in, in closing here, I want to go to Ezekiel 2020 because this is the other passage that God gave to me to sort of put in perspective 2020 and 2021. Uh, and so Ezekiel 2020, by the way, you need to read for yourself at home where you can really absorb it, Exodus and Ezekiel 2020 and 2021. But here's, uh, here's Ezekiel. Um, it says, And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you. Mm. They're personal to God, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Why is he so upset? 
because he said, this is my opportunity to show you who I am. This is personal to me. In verse 21, notwithstanding, the children rebelled against me, not against my commandments, right? He's not putting it out here. Well, you didn't do what I said. No, you rebelled against, this is personal to God. You rebelled against me. This was my Sabbath, he said. You rebelled against me. They walked not in my statutes, neither kept my judgments to do them, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. They polluted my Sabbaths. Then I said, I would pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the wilderness. And, uh, and uh, we're about to see that God was not happy with folks going contrary to what they knew was right. And I'll just leave it there. Uh, I, I will say we all knew what was right. And some of us did what we knew was right. And some of us went ahead and listened to other voices. I found out, and I've said this before, I found out who I pastor in my own church right. yeah. and who I don't pastor in my own church. Yeah. I literally have heard people saying, well, we're listening to a pastor from California and taking his advice on whether we should attend church. Really? Well, what are you doing in my church? Well, I've had people say, well, we're listening to the governor of this state and following those guys. Well, I guess that governor must be your pastor then. So, listen, God is not playing with regard to putting resources for you in his church. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. God put you into a church, not so that you could just do whatever you want and listen to whoever you want. And look, I, I, I never try to control anybody. So if, if this isn't the church for you, people get so mad when I say this, but if this is not the church for you, go find it. Go find it. If I'm not the pastor for you, if I can't shepherd you and show you uh, the, the place to find spiritual sustenance that will sustain you, will the, that will cause you to grow in the things of God, for Pete's sake, go find somebody that can, that you will respect and follow. Because I don't need the headache, for one. And I don't need to spend our resources as a ministry and as a church on you if you're rebellious to the things of God. Go rebel in somebody else's church. And uh, that's just how it is. That's just how it is. I want to say this, uh, that in Joel, the second chapter, I want to just show you this because it's so amazing because I'm just going to take you to uh, one last thing in closing. Um, but I want, want to read this last scripture for you. Joel, the second chapter in the 23rd verse, it says this, Be glad then, ye children of Zion. That is a type of the church. So he's prophesying to the church. Um, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And I wanted to read that to you because... Um, the Lord is uh, putting some timeline stuff in perspective for us and where we are in the timeline of eternity. I uh, already mentioned the 7,000-year plan, the seven dispensations. Uh, by the way, we're hanging right off the end of that sixth dispensation. It's almost over. Jesus is almost ready to, to return any minute, any second. Um, and then we'll begin the, uh, the tribulation has to take place, and then the second coming, and then we will begin the kingdom age. Uh, and rule and reign with him for a thousand years. But I want to just um, point you to a couple of things, and I'm going to talk a little more about this on Sunday, but the there are some spectacular revelations that God had a timetable for in the, the history of the church that were very important for the church to receive them in order to move on and to go into the deeper things of God. Um, a lot of people are thinking that they're deep and they're in charge of all the revelations, like all the false prophets. They have no clue of what they're talking about, and they're going off into false doctrine because they refuse to receive uh, a major part of the timeline um, of revelations that God had for the church. So, But I want to just uh, give you a couple of them. And the last generation, uh, by the way, a generation scripturally is how many years? 40. 
It's 40 years. Um, and that was first defined by the generation that was required in the wilderness, 40 years in the wilderness, so that an entire generation could be removed and that the people who didn't whine and complain and gossip and, and rebel and all that stuff could move over into the promised land. Um, and so... Um, so it's a 40, prophetically, a generation is 40 years. That's important, um, and I, I will get into it at a later date. But um, the last generation of the 19th century, uh, some very important revelations called dispensationalism and rapture theology were being born in the church and being revealed in the church. And we'll get into some of that history. It's really phenomenally interesting. But that was all happening the last generation of the 19th century leading up to January 1st of 2001. 111, which designates a brand new beginning in church history. 111. And of course, that is the day that a gay man named Charles Parham had started a Bible college in Topeka, Kansas. If you want to know why I know he's gay, I'm happy to tell you after the Bible study. Uh, and he was a man of God that started a Bible college. By the way, Sister Jasmine, they had no tuition. <laughs> and they began studying the day of Pentecost and speaking in tongues. And of course, we know that on January 1st, of 1901 that a, a woman by the name of Agnes Osmond who'd been praying uh, and fasting for the baptism of the Holy Ghost she became just impressed to have Brother Parham lay hands on her and this gay man laid his hands on that woman and she was baptized in the Holy Ghost and thus began the entire Pentecostal movement. Wow. Oh, woo, my God. Hallelujah. Uh, wow. Think history might be repeating itself in a different century? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yeah, that's all covered up, by the way, in church history. Sure. But I can give you some uh, proof of it. Um, <clears throat> so that was in the last generation of the 19th century, as, uh, and he, he was very um, fluent in dispensationalism and rapture theology. Um, but, and by the way, the reason I read that scripture in Joel, it said the latter rain will be given in the first month of the year. Mm -hmm. That happened in January of 1901. So that is the fulfillment. And, and just in case you're wondering whether it is the, um, it said that I'll give you the latter rain moderately and I'll pour out um, the, I, or rather I'll give you the former rain moderately and then I'll cause the rain to fall, the latter rain. Well, the moderate rain was the day of Pentecost. You know how I know? Because as of the statistics um, that I found for 2011, there are more than 584 million spirit-filled Christians after the latter rain. So as of 2011. So I would say this qualifies as not being moderate, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the latter rain was a greater uh, by number uh, move of God. So uh, there... So we see that that was happening. Um, then in the last generation of the 20th century, this comes to our time, uh, there was a move in certain ministers, not very many, but uh, including myself, God was revealing a specific important doctrine called the kingdom uh, or the, the gospel of the kingdom or the doctrine of Basilea. And that was um, being formed in the last generation of the 20th century. And then immediately in 2001, something very significant happened and the Twin Towers fell and the last generation began that leads us into the end time. So uh, now 
Why do I bring that up? Because exactly halfway through the last generation, if a generation is 40 years, here we are halfway through the last generation. God allows the signs to begin to yes. come like we've never seen right. saying, get ready, I'm coming back. These are the signs, the false prophets, the pestilence, the test of my entire church. Here's the pestilence. And are you still going to keep my Sabbaths? That's how this ties in to the Bible study here. But what happened? The church polluted God's Sabbaths. False prophets rose and they began polluting, get this, the doctrine of the kingdom age, which is synonymous with the Sabbath of God, the time of rest. They rose and began to preach doctrines like the the uh, manifest sons of God doctrine, like all of these doctrines that I mentioned on Sunday that say, and even amillennialism where there is no millennial reign, where everything is just going to get better and better. And Jesus is just going to come and say, wow, you guys did a great job. Let's, let's just have a party together. Uh, and literally perverting this time that correlates with the Sabbath period of human history. Everybody with me still? Yes, amen. So that is, it's so important to understand what God is showing us and what he's pointing to, even with the signs of the end time. Um, and so uh, I, I want to end with this. Jezebel was uh, outed to us recently mm -hmm. in Obadiah, the first verse, as an ambassador among the heathen. And so what does that mean? Well, specifically that she's an ambassador, knowing that she came from uh, a father who was the king over a country of Baal worshipers, that she worshipped Baal, that she, she raised up prophets of Baal. She, she slew the, the true prophets of God. So Jezebel is specifically connected then in Revelation as the spirit of false prophecy. And so what I'm saying about this is that in the tribulation times that were the world is heading into it is the spirit of jezebel and that's where this false prophecy spirit comes into play that jezebel operating through these false prophets is literally going to be the ambassador between the church and the antichrist spirit mm. so if you're wondering how is it possible that the church would fall into such error and such catastrophe that they would be part of this one world religion and fall prey to all the lies of the Antichrist and the Jezebel spirit that's going to overtake the earth. Well, you don't have to look too far because all you have to do is see how Christians have acted on social media. And Jezebel, if you're if you have any spiritual sensitivity whatsoever, Jezebel comes right through all those posts. The arrogance, the self-righteousness of telling people how they should act and, and of, of criticizing ministers and churches that are contrary to what you think and just, just facing down people that don't agree with you. Yeah, Jezebel has already firmly implanted her philosophy within the church and I would say that she's already got a following within the church and it's not far-fetched to think that she is going to bridge the gap between Christian churches to doctrines of a an antichrist power who is then going to begin to explain that, oh, we're not that different. We all serve the same God, and, and Allah is not some other God. And, and a Muslim individual that is going to come into power, and the same arrogant, self-righteous, Jezebel-infested Christians are going to say, yeah, that's right. And if you disagree with it, then you're wrong, and how dare you? And, and then those same Christians who are deceived by the spirit of Jezebel, suddenly it's going to make sense to them that everybody should take a mark. Mm. Right. But that's what our leader says, and it's not the mark of the beast. Are you kidding me? Oh, you're so stupid. That's not what that was talking about. Here's why this is something that we all should do. It's coming. Yes, it is. And Jezebel 
is going to facilitate it. That's why we had better pay attention. That's why God is revealing in this church the revelations of what we have just been through in 2020 and what we have uh, been asked to watch because every part of it is relevant to what is coming. We are the eunuchs of Obadiah. God has specifically anointed us to have her number and to be immune from everything that she tries to do to seduce us. No, not today, not ever. We have an anointing over you and we will not fall for the seducing spirit that is loosed upon the church. Amen. We're the eunuchs of Obadiah. We're the ones that can get close enough to get a hold of her by the hair of the head and throw her down and defeat her. And if anybody will hear what is coming from this specifically anointed group that God has positioned in the end time church, it is the eunuch nation that has an anointing to provide what is necessary for the entire bride of Christ Amen. to prepare herself. And Jesus put it this way. He said that the bride has prepared her herself and made herself ready. Amen. And so that's what I wanted to end with. We're in a time where false prophets are going to be perverting the word of God more and more. Look, they have just been outed by God, but do you think that's going to stop any of them? No. Or any of their followers? No. You can, I don't recommend it, but you can go online and they have increased their followers yep. after this spectacular debacle with the election. So no, it's not going to stop, but it's going to continue because there's a plan in place that has been prophesied by none other than Jesus himself in the book of Revelation. And this is how it's about to happen. I, I don't know about you. I never knew that I would get to know how it was going to happen. But isn't it phenomenal that God, in spite of all of our whining, <laughs> why me? <laughs> Oh, God, this is so horrible and so hard. You know, in spite of all of that yeah. self-pity, yeah. I didn't even know where God was positioning me. He was positioning me to know things that prophets have desired to look into. Right. But we're never going to be revealed except that we come through a specific path. Amen. And so I will just tell you that I... Once and for all, I believe I gave this up a long time ago, but once and for all, I quit complaining for who God made me. I quit complaining and arguing with my maker, striving with the potter over what he made on the wheel. And I'm, I have never been more excited to be in this place, in this position, and to be, uh, to be in a place where we're receiving the things that God is revealing in this time. Amen. God really must have thought something of you to allow you to be part of this as well. Because out of everybody that could be sitting in your place right now, he chose you. And you made it through some insurmountable odds by the power of God to be qualified to be where you are today.